In this video, I will give an overview and my observations of the manuscript play of Euripides titled The Bacchae. Euripides was born circa 484 BC, Athens, Greece. He is described as the last and perhaps the most influential tragic dramatist to come out of ancient Greece. Due to the length of the manuscript and the translator's notes, I have read the full manuscript of this play in a separate video. The link, along with my research links, are provided in the description of this video. Welcome to my channel. I am Daisy, your hostess. The Baki is a tragedy based on the Greek myth of King Pentheus of Thebes and his mother Agave, and their punishment by the god Dionysus, who happens to be Pentheus' cousin. A literary aspect that makes the Bacchae distinctive in that the chorus is integrated into the plot and the god is not a distant presence but a character in the play. You'll note that if you listen to the manuscript. To me, the theme of this play is of vindication and justice and also the inevitable aspect of nature which, as much as we may not want to admit it, in the most primitive part, we humans are like all things on this planet, tied intrinsically to nature itself, which is in an ever-perpetuating flux. Oddly, that flux, or constant change and development, of one's genuine character, rather than a socialized persona, was one of the core tenets of the Bacchus. Before I get into my insights of Euripides Bacchae, I want to comment on the main character, Dionysus. He is spreading a new mystery religion throughout the land, and he boldly tells us he's been to many lands sharing his wine and dance. I am extracting data from one of the primary sources of the time, uh, the first century BC Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, who is known for his Biblioteca Historica. In his book, he cites that there were several versions of lore of Dionysus from ancient writers, both the composers of myths and the poets, and some of these were Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes. The mythographers who represent the god as having a human form all agree on Dionysus's association with the discovery and cultivation of the vine and all the operations of making of wine, although they disagree on whether there was a single Dionysus or several. Some conceive that there were three persons at separate periods and to each of these they ascribe deeds which were peculiarly his own. The most ancient Dionysus was an Indian from India, first to press out the clusters of grapes and to devise the use of wine as a natural product. Now, this Dionysus is visited with an army all the inhabited world and gave instruction both as to the culture of the vine and the crushing of the clusters. It is also said that he founded a few cities in India, one of which he named Nisa, wishing to leave there a memorial of that city in Egypt where he had been reared. He also planted ivy in the Indian Nisa. The ivy is a symbol of everlasting life. Now, as a point of interest, in the 6th century, Stephanus of Byzantium, the author of a work on geography, knew 10 cities called Nisa, in Arabia, in Caria, in the Caucasus, in Egypt, on Euboea, on the Helicon, in India, in Libya, on Nexos, and in Thrace. So, just wanted to throw that in for you. Now, the second Dionysus was from the union of Zeus and Persephone, though some say it was Demeter. And they have that Dionysus represented by them as the first man to have yoked oxen to the plow. Human beings before that time prepared the ground by hand, and the masses were relieved of their great distress, and in return for this wisdom, those whom had benefited accorded to him the honors and sacrifices like those offered to the gods. And because of the magnitude of his service to them, and as a special symbol and token, the painters and sculptors of the time represented Dionysus with horns. 
And finally, the third Dionysus was born in Boeotian Thebes from the union of Zeus and Semele, the daughter of Cadmus. Zeus had become enamored of Semele and lured by her beauty, had consorted with her. But Hera, being the jealous partner and anxious to punish her, assumed the form of one of the women's confidant and suggested to Semele that Zeus should lie with her while having the same majesty and honor in his outward appearance as when he takes Hera to his arms. Semele, unable to endure the majesty of his grandeur, died and brought forth the babe before the appointed time. Zeus brought the babe to Nisa in Arabia. There the boy was reared by nymphs, and these nymphs were well versed in the arts of herbs, so they could have been high priestesses, and these were the doctors of the time, providing midwifery and healing services. The child was given the name Dionysus after his father Dios and after the place Nisa. He grew to be of unusual beauty and spent his time at dances and with bands of women and in every kind of luxury and amusement. With the passing of time, he organized these women into an army and armed them with thirsi, or the thyrsus, which was really a weapon. It was a spear that was disguised as a wand. He also instructed all men who were pious and cultivated a life of justice in the knowledge of these rites that he was creating, and initiated them into his mysteries. And in every place he held great festive assemblies and celebrated musical contests. Unfortunately, some men, especially in leadership, looked down upon him and kept saying that he was leading the Bacchants and introducing the mystery rites as a way to seduce the wives of other men. Such persons that went against him were punished right away, either by being stricken with madness. It seems that Dionysus was very well versed, probably taught by these high priestesses in the ways of herbs and poisons. Or he would cause them, while still living, to be torn limb from limb by the hands of the woman. In other cases, he destroyed those who opposed him by a military device, which obviously was these spears. And people were taken by surprise. I mean, no one's expecting to have wands that would actually kill. These lances had tips of iron, and they were covered either by pine cones and ivy leaves. He went through the lands spreading the Bacchus rites, which were based on a seasonal death-rebirth theme of vegetation and on spirit possession. It also involved trans-induction that was central to the cult, and it involved not only chemonosis, but also the invocation of spirit. It, it involved these words by means of chants and ecstatic communal dancing to drum and pipe, much like today's raves parties, and it included sexual orgies. The teachings of these mystery rites were written in the Orphic poems, and yet it was unlawful to recount the details to the uninitiated. Revealing the innermost mysteries was punishable by death. Keep in mind, when we hear any of these ancient historians or authors of classics, myths, and poetry, we should consider the need to suspend our way of thinking in the present and time travel and realize that it is a whole different culture that lack our current ways of civility. If we fail to time travel, then we get locked into a current judgment and we miss the opportunity to see with that mind's eye the culture as it is evolving. It is funny to me that the more I look at these texts, these ancient texts, whether they be of a religious nature or of mythical nature, the more I realize while we may have advanced technologically, we have made very little progress in the development of the altruistic nature of man. Now that I have set some foundation about the main character, which allows us to see that whether the character was true or myth, the play 
that Euripides lays out for us gives us insight of the mystery religion that was a factual thing of the time. He's not the only one writing about it. So to know more about Dionysus, his twofold intention in this play, we need to get a little information about his grandfather on his mother's side. According to what can be extracted from the letters of Herodotus, who is traditionally regarded as the father of history because he was the first historian to collect and systematically document events and create an account of them, and it was compiled in his single major work known as the Histories. He writes in the 58th chapter of his fifth book that Cadmus is recognized as the founder and the first king of Thebes, a powerful town in the ancient times close to Athens. He is also known as the man who brought the writing and the alphabet from the Phoenicians to the Greeks, and through the Greeks, it was then spread out throughout the whole world, or the whole inhabited world. One author calculated that Cadmus came to Thebes around 1400 BC. Now, by succession, Pentheus was a king of Thebes, and he was grandson of Cadmus, he was considered an arrogant king and ultimately paid the price for denying the divinity of the god Dionysus. So now, as we look at this manuscript, the play opens with Dionysus arriving at Thebes, visiting his mother's grave, and gives us a backstory and reveals that he is son of god Zeus through his mother, Salome, daughter of King Cadmus, but she died before he was born. And in honor of his mother, he plants the vine by his mother's grave. We learn about the lay of the land, the golden grounds of Lydian and Phrygian, referring to the sand, you know, the topography there, which now is parts of Turkey. He also mentions Persia, which is modern-day Iran. Not only do we learn about the surrounding lands, but also the state of the politics. These following lands are at war, the Bactrian war holds, as he mentions, which in our time are the countries of Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Then he describes the storm-oppressed clime of the Mede. This is now corresponding to the modern regions of Azerbaijan, Kurdistan, and parts of Kermanshah. And we're led to understand that Arabi and Asia are not at war, but are described as proud, embattled cities. I take that to mean that they're ready for action should something come up. Euripides points at the symmetry between standard self-ascriptions of what could be religion and the political influences of the area when he says that these are Hellene and barbarian interwrought, kind of letting us know that civility is at its early stages in humanity. I may digress here and share that I am not a scholar. I was listening to Dr. Amon Hillman from his YouTube channel called Lady Babylon, and he recommended this literature as a reading. Now, Dr. Hillman is a philologist, and he's got some doctorate degrees also in bacteriology. And what I like about him is that he does not push his opinion, but what he does is he encourages people to honor our history and to look back not so much on secondary sources but to go read these ancient texts unfortunately we I don't know about you but I would depend on learning Latin and and what uh, Greek to really be able to um, touch the gold as I would say you know touch those original texts so I am indebted to um, these people that take the time to translate these ancient writings from these people that were there at the beginning of our modern written history. So anyway, I am fascinated by its cultural richness, the, these documents, I, and I wish to share it with you. So these are simply my observations, and wherever possible, I have research sources to learn a bit more of the culture. And as I mentioned earlier on in the beginning of this video, I have left links for you to follow up if you are so inclined. And links of special interest would be of those primary sources, and links of special interest would be of those primary sources of the historians of the era, such as Herodotus and Diodorus, who included 
in their historical library, these myths, had these stories not been recorded, we would have lost them. I believe these stories that originally were being passed down orally reveal the cult or cultural nuances of rituals or dogmas that would form the foundations of some of our, our main religions and government structures. These so-called myth stories can be found recorded as far back as 3400 BC with the Sumerian cuneiform markings on clay tablets. And when you find out those beginnings and the reason why behind it all, a whole new world will open up. But truth be told, it is not hidden. It is interwoven in religious and mythical, mystical and occult texts, in poem and hymns in history. It is all there in open view. This is for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. Seek and you will find. The truth may hurt for a minute and then it will set you free. Back to the Baki. It is in the introduction that we learn of Dionysus' intention. He has been going around the world teaching his dance and his rites of mysteries, teaching the vine. He arrives at Hellas to bring this knowledge of the vine growing and the rites of the mysteries. It appears to me that Euripides had some first-hand knowledge of the rites, yet he was somewhat reserved in spilling all the details, even though he did not omit some of the abominations that transgressed during the ritual in the production of this manuscript for this play. But most important, there is a more nefarious reason for Dionysus' visit to Greece. He seeks to avenge himself and his mother's name. His mother Semele, daughter of King Cadmus, has been accused of sinning. Someone has twisted the story and spreading rumors that Zeus punished her, struck her with lightning, and she died. When in fact, Zeus had seduced her, and Hera, knowing of his unfaithfulness, disguised herself and spoke with Semele as suggested that she asked Zeus to engage with her in all his glory, as he did with Hera, knowing very well that Semele would not be able to bear that energy. Zeus, in his attempt to please Semele, did so, and by that act, killed her. Unfortunately, yet fortunately, he was able to save their unborn child, Dionysus. Now, after so many years and grown up, Dionysus has a bone to pick with his aunts, who are the ones tarnishing his mother's name by spreading these rumors. From the opening of the play, we are led to believe that Dionysus is well-traveled and seems to have some ability to hypnotize or spellcast or know of the occult arts. He understands the power of words and drugs and he sets his intentions. He says, quote, I have bound upon the necks of them the harness of my rights till she crave her part in mine adoring. Thus must I speak clear to save my mother's fame and crown me here as true God born by Semele to Zeus. End quote. He, along with his band, set out to lure the town folk to the mountains to celebrate the rites. Somehow people are mesmerized. I mean, everybody loves that new fad, right? And they were curious to partake in these midnight dances of drink and song and orgies. So in a monologue, Dionysus takes offense that the new king of Thebes, his cousin, uh, his aunt Agave's son, Pentheus, does not want to honor him as a god and makes it clear that once he has settled this score, he's off to new lands, and if he or any of his entourage of women get attacked, he will personally bring wrath. Now keep in mind, those are not ordinary women he travels with. We can somehow understand that these were high priestesses. They knew stuff about herbs. They knew stuff about drugs, about poison, especially snake venom, because if you go look at some of the imagery that we have of that 
period, or anything that's related to Bacchus rites, these women, many of them, not only do they have these spears, but they also have snakes in their hands. So they are master spear dancers and can wield their wand. He calls these women in, in this Euripides um, Baki, women maniac armies. So why do you think that is? He tells us that they are handpicked by him from his homeland, Lydia, and that he and the mystic goddess Rhea put together the song. So there's something that is, you know, part of this. There's this song that somehow has something to do with the rites. The song, which I believe are the words to be used in the mystery rites. Now, Rhea, which if you create a family tree, is Zeus' mother. And that would make her grandmother to Dionysus. Through that verse, we can understand that there's an idea that Dionysus is getting instructions from the gods, from a divine source, a divine fountain. So he sends out his team of recruiters to go and get more followers. And they boast of his many names, titles, and all the places he's traveled to. There are many different names for the same character or the personification of this energy that we attribute to Dionysus. And is probably one of the most challenging thing about following any sense of order in mythology, which to me seems to blend it between the cultures. Dionysus is also known as Bromios, Bacchios, or Bacchus, Lacos, Eleutherus, Sagrius, Sebaceous. See what I mean? It could get rather confusing. But anyway. Euripides nails it as he introduces the chorus where one of the maidens reveals why the town folk should celebrate the Bacchus mystery. They're selling this thing. They're selling this Bacchus mystery. They're selling this Bacchus mystery religion. Why be a part of this following? And in a nutshell, the maiden says, you do what you're told to do. You disguise yourself. You do any kind of work for the end goal. And the end goal is to be invited or included in the mystery rites of the cult. The mystery itself. To partake in that mania, this is what she said. Quote, we toiled, but the toil is as the prize is. Thou mystery. End quote. These women are not to be messed with. They go all out. If anyone defies this God, Dionysus, they said, quote, Let the heart keep silence that defies us. End quote. And you'll see as this play evolves, one can see that this is a threat. A silent heart is a non beating heart, in my opinion. They also tell the new followers that Dionysus is special because he has drunk from the living fountain. Now, what is that? So feel free to leave me a comment if you know what that is. Again, we can begin to see the formation of a mystery religion, the desire to be part of something more, the desire to disconnect from the daily work, the outworn race, to belong, and also to finally have something or some, someone non-human to hold us up, to give us hope. And Euripides neatly weaves that in the maiden's chorus, saying that this is by decree, ordained by Sibylle. You might ask, who is Sibylle? She was the great Phrygian mother of the gods. A primal nature goddess worshipped with orgiastic rites, which dates from about the 6th century. She was connected to the concerns of women, the midwife, the healer, the priestess. She was the protector from enemies. Sibeli was often associated with Rhea, mother of Zeus. So we see that interesting connection. 
During the 5th century BC, Sibeli or Geastic cult dominated the central and northwestern regions of Anatolia and was introduced to Greece via the Boeotian town of Thebes, as we see happening in this play. Are we to conclude that Dionysus is copying the rites from the Sibeli mysteries and adding a little bit more because she ordained it? I mean, that's what we're told, right? And by definition, to ordain means to confer holy orders. I don't want to go deep into the Sibeli mysteries. I only bring it up because Euripides linked the Bacchus mystery with the Sibeli mysteries in that verse. Yeah, keep in mind, cults were not always welcomed by those in authority, and King Pentheus was one of them, and he considered this group of people a threat to social order, and they had to be stopped. So we've seen this thing where governments get involved. And apparently, Sibeli cult was sanctioned by the authorities. She was recognized as an agrarian goddess and the great mother of manga matter. And this most likely had to do with the Sibylline books, which were books of prophecy consulted by the Roman Senate in times of emergencies. That's a whole different other, uh, you know, um, topic. But it had been predicted in the Sibylline books that Italy would be freed by an Idaean mother of Pessinus. To many, this meant Sibylli. And so the cult of Sibeli lasted until the 4th century CE, at which time forced Christianity dominated the religion's landscape and pagan beliefs and rituals gradually became transformed or discarded to suit the new faith. It is documented that Dionysus' cult was viewed as being excessively brutal, supposedly involving ritual murder and sexual excess. So much so that in 186 BCE, the Roman Senate, recognizing a potential menace, suppressed the worship of the Greek god of wine, Dionysus, known to the Romans as Bacchus. Now, going back to Euripides' Bacchae, the maids are still indoctrinating their followers and telling the history of their founder, with Hera not knowing that Zeus saved his son and you know, his son was Semele, and took him to Dion to raise him. They said, quote, The queen knew not beside him till the perfect hour was there. Then a horn god was found, and a god with serpents crowned. End of quote. Interesting that there's so many similarities here to the Jesus story, one being crowned with serpents, the other one with um, thorns, the serpents here have a whole different meaning. But yet, I know that sometimes we see the picture of um, Dionysus with also the crown of, what's it called, uh, wine, you know, the grapes, the grape wine. Now, Euripides is a bit cryptic, and I wonder if he's talking about potion and application in this verse where he says, quote, The songs of serpents sound in the mazes of their hair. End quote. Were these women also priestesses? This kind of, you know, makes us wonder, what were they? Did they know the uses of snake venom? Were they adding some concoction to their hair as part of the rites? And was this inducing mania? Or were they using it part to probably apply it to people? And also to the end of their spearheads? Would that application bring them to that mania that Euripides mentions in the beginning? What do you think? Let me know about your, your, your comments on that. And for you herb lovers, maybe you're trying to recreate a mythological garden. Here's an herb for your garden that was mentioned in this manuscript, the Bryony. I think that Euripides must have been a Bacchus initiate himself. This is way too specific as he subtly tells us how to prepare for the rites of Bacchus mystery. Seems like we need to go to the garden and get some Brioni. It has the magical reputation of the English mandrake. It was said to be substituted for the rare and more expensive mandragora. Like that of the true mandrake, the root was used as an aphrodisiac and in love filters, it increased fertility. Hence, Dionysus is both known as the god of wine and also the god of fertility. 
So if you want to blend in and partake of the Bacchus initiation, the maids want you to bring your oak wand and the pine wand and wear the fawn skin fringed in purity with fleecy white. Do you think they come with Prada or Versace labels? It's interesting because um, when I was uh, deputy sheriff in Dade County many, many years ago, Florida, um, I remember the, the call came in as animal abuse. And when we got to the scene in this house, uh, this Cuban family was all dressed in white. I mean, the everybody, like all the furniture was like moved off around to the walls. Um, there was an altar place to somewhere in the house there. And everybody was dressed in white. And, of course, the neighbor was complaining that they were taking the animals and killing them and doing bloodletting. But anyway, um, our part was not to interfere in their religious uh, rights as far as, you know, the freedom of religion. Um, it was We were there for the safety of the animals that were all caged up and, and looked pretty uncomfortable. Um, anyway, but that's for another story. But here it is. We see this, this white theme, wearing white as a symbol of purity, the symbolism, a theme that, predominates, you know, and then we make these associations, right? Uh, anyway, let's go back to this thing. I don't need to traumatize my brain with my past life, <laughs> my past life and my current life. <laughs> anyway, um, the uh, band of followers tell us that we will be cleansed by the wands waving. There will be dancing, chanting, and praying, and Bromios himself, remember, different name for uh, Dionysus, He's going to take us there by the magic of his breath. I wonder what Euripides meant by that, or what did the maidens meant by that? The magic of his breath? Interesting. The other maidens tell us that there is one assigned to lead the wild orb of our orgies. So it looks like there's going to be a circle. I mean, wild orb. I I. I don't know what that means or if there's going to be an orb that's prepared and we're supposed to drink from it. Who knows? Um, but there's going to be singing and chanting. And Euripides specifically mentions the Korobant. Now, the Korobants, these were armed attendants and priests and priestesses that were associated with initiation rituals. So these are like, um, if you're, if you're like uh, looking for order, there was some type of structure there already. And these korobans were involved in frenzied dancing to drum beats, similar to the rituals that were used by the Phrygian goddess Sibylle. Needless to say, it does get a bit crazy when the satyrs show up, I mean, half men, half beasts, lewd yet skilled in music, who are partial to the wine. And so the way that myth tells us, when they're not at a Bacchus rite, they're at some drunken orgy or frightening sheeps and cattle. So the maidens sing, and their song invites us to forget the drudgery of a race outworn. And somehow, I feel like our race is still outworn. And so they add in this song, Join in, red quick fountains, the blood of the hill goat torn, the glory of wild beast ravenings. As barbaric as this sound, these are not mere words. Oh no, they are telling you and me what this Dionysus mystery rite is all about without telling us. I guess they don't want to get in trouble. There is blood drinking. There is tearing animals apart. We hope it's just animals, but it seems that if they don't find animals, a human wandering through the forest might do just fine. And all this to reach the glory of wild beast ravenings. I, have to, I had to get that Oxford Dictionary to understand this ravening thing. And Oxford Dictionary describes ravening to mean extremely hungry and hunting for prey. So we have to partake in very specific rites to get to that state. Can you imagine the kind of dance and wine that could bring someone to the state of being extremely hungry to hunt for prey, to tear it apart with the bare hands, and then jump into orgies? Some might say, I'll have what he's having, pass the wine, or not. <laughs> 
And these upcoming mystery religions or cult founders understood the human psychology of rituals, of indoctrination via repetition, of the malleability of the human mind, of the power of drugs and disconnecting the mind. They tied it all with the song, the chants, the dance, the acts, the sex. While the meaning of the rituals may be abstract, the implements used created that mental portal to make that association that began the transformation of the mind. I mean, for example, the water or blood began to be connected with the symbol of life or the act of dance associated with this cleansing and liberation, etc. Even in our times today, we use symbols. They're everywhere from corporations, governments, and religion. The golden arches, especially here in the West here. We start thinking about McDonald's and hamburgers and fries. The S with the two vertical lines for currency and the cross. Many identify with religion affiliation. And each one of these symbols may elicit a feeling, a thought, or a reaction, just to name a few. Feel free to share your thoughts on this. I'd like to hear, read your comments. Ah, we need to stay here. We're, we're here walking through the forest to this Bake uh, ritual. So we must return. The maidens are talking. Let's listen. Dionysus' maidens are cleverly revealing how everyone is getting lulled into their trance, not just by wine. Quote, Through the air dim perfume steams of Syrian frankincense and he, our leader, from his thyrsus spray to waken all that faint and astray. End quote. They add that all this will lead you to the vision of holiness. Do you think that something was in that smoke, that incense that was making people high? Now, Cadmius and Tiresias the prophet are both in disguise, adorning Bacchus wardrobes, carrying their thyrses, wearing fawn skin and ivy crown, and both are ready to recognize Dionysus for who he is in that lineage of the gods and also as son to Cadmus's deceased daughter, Semele. As they head out to partake in the celebration, they overhear the young king, Pentheus, speaking to his soldier about the rumor that wives and sisters and daughters are heading to the hills to partake in the secret rites. And it seems that the Bacchus rites have become very popular, and Pentheus is quite aware that these rites involve sex, as he mentions Aphrodite, the goddess of sexual love, in response to the soldier's report. He is told that there's a man out there, he's a man of charm and spell, and cloudy fragrances. Can you name any aroma that can charm you by its fragrance? Well, Dionysus has the good stuff. We need to bottle some of it. Can we order it through Amazon? Anyway, Penthus wants to put an end to the clandestine gatherings and the blasphemy that is being spread that this cult leader was, you know, reconceived. He was born perfect from the thigh of Zeus. And now he's declaring himself as, uh, you know, to be God. And while he's talking to the soldier, he spots his dad and the prophet wearing those funny uh, dresses. And, uh, you know, he's like, what are you doing? I can't help to feel that this was more than just a new God. You know, it sounds like the whole world order was changing. Yet, despite the offense taken by the young king, the seer tries to impart wisdom. And I take it that Euripides is giving us some insight to um, the idea that there is a concept of physical and spiritual awareness uh, by what the seer was telling um, Pentheus, quote, There are two spirits, one personified in Demeter, Greek goddess of the harvest. She is the earth feeds man's frame with sustenance of things dry. Second is the power from Semele born, he found the liquid shower. 
hid in the grape. He rests man's spirit dim from grieving when in the vine exalteth him. End quote. So in a way, he is trying to tell Pentheus, should not a man be honored for his contributions to mankind? The knowledge of cultivating the vine, of making this beverage, this drink that helps you disconnect, it makes you feel good, and also the storing of these dried fruits. And I could not help to see a parallel in the verse where the seer says, quote, Being God, the blood of him is set before the gods in sacrifice that we, for his sake, may be blessed. End quote. And the phrase used with Jesus in Christianity, mind you, the Bacche by Euripides was written in 405 B.C. Jesus was born around 7 or through 4 B.C. And the New Testament was written years after Jesus' death, around 50 to 100 C.E. So just think about those dates and the, the rise of Christianity as a religion. And where was it? Uh, grabbing its, you know, um, foundation. Just think about that. We see that similarity in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 25. God presented him as the atoning sacrifice through faith in his blood in order to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had passed over the sins committed beforehand. Anyway, I just wanted to give some food for thought there. The seer, Tiresias, tries to convince the young king to see the truth of what really happened and that Zeus did all he could to protect the child and devised him a divine defense by tricking Hera and, and, um, and saving baby Dionysus. What I also found revealing about the Dionysus rites was the idea of this state of frenzy and, you know, the mania and the seer saying that it is in a state of frenzy the prophecy is born. Like, like you need to disconnect your brain. You need to go into a higher state. And he says by this meaning that when we, dis, when we can disconnect from our outworn race and achieve that state of frenzy, that mania, we have things revealed to us and we know that God himself dwells and speaks the things to be. Imagine if that was what the maidens are promising to the town folks to help them see the vision of things to come. I can't imagine why not all these people were involved in the Bacchus rites. But what I don't understand sometimes how we want to escape to those things unknown and then we miss out the life we have here. So the seer also warns the young king that it has been reported that others have tried to stop the Bacchus rites, and he says that even human armies have fled. They have been fled maddened and paralyzed. And it makes me wonder, what was in that incense or the wine, or were the thirstless beer had poisoned? What could paralyze and drive a person mad? Trained soldiers, imagine that. So Euripides, through the maidens, tells that Dionysus' thyrsus could throw flames. What kind of technology was Dionysus aware of? Where did he get that knowledge? So the seer and his father, the former king, Cadmus, tells him that they're going to honor this god, inasmuch they are honoring their bloodline and recommends Pentheus, even though he thinks a certain way, to lie and honor this god as well. Pentheus is stubborn. He doesn't listen. He's determined to bring order back to the realm and order Dionysus to be found and brought back in shackles. So before I go on, I want to share one of my favorite verses in this whole tragic play. Quote, Hidden from the eyes of day, watchers are there in the skies that can see man's life and prize. Life is such a little thing. End quote. 
Oh, so much to take from that. But anyway, in the meantime, the maidens continue to recruit and indoctrinate through their chants. They tell us of the wonders of the Papal Isles, the place of Olympus where the muses dwell. They reveal more aspects of this god Dionysus, of his majestic birth and his love for earth and for the offering of wine to mankind. And we're also told that he has a bone to pick with those that turn away from joy. We are given instructions to love the day and the night, as well as both dark and light. And that reminds me of the law of duality that our New Age or metaphysics talk about, and science also. Um, but also, it made me contemplate about that we cannot turn away from joy. And uh, I think about how in America, I think that Americans work really hard. Um, so many have two or three jobs just to enjoy some of life's small pleasures that so much so that they can't have the pleasure and this thing about work 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 and here comes this god reminding us not to turn away from joy so no matter how hard life may be to find something that brings you back to joy that's what I'm taking away from from this, which I think is a worthwhile pursuit. Don't you think that joy is a worthwhile pursuit? I mean, I don't think that I'm going to run into some Bacchus thing and find little animals to kill and tear apart and drink their blood. But um, I think that we've come past that and have evolved <laughs> that we don't need to do that. Anyway, let's continue on here. Dionysus gets arrested. And it reminds me of the arrest of Jesus in the early hours of the morning in that Garden of Gethsemane. And neither resisted. Funny thing that the soldier told Dionysus that he's not bringing him of his own will. Like, I, I wouldn't do this. But that he's being, he's doing it because he's following orders. So when Pentheus first lays eyes on Dionysus, oh my goodness. I had the feeling that something was already happening. Something was at play there. The young king couldn't help himself but marvel at the effeminate features of Dionysus. Yet we may know more about Dionysus' age by the way that Pentheus addresses him. Or he's just simply insulting him. I don't know which one. What do you think? He calls him Sera, which, according to the dictionary, is an archaic and obsolete word, a term of address to an inferior male or, commonly, a child. How old was Dionysus? 12, 13, 15? Interesting, huh? During his interrogation, this issue of his age comes up when he asks if Zeus is still begetting young gods. Dionysus is cryptic in his responses, very much like Jesus talking in parables, and mentions that he was given emblems by God that cannot be revealed except to the elected one. So I want to know more about those emblems. If anyone out there knows anything about that, please do uh, leave me a comment. I'd like to, um, to know more. So the interrogation goes on, accusing Dionysus of being a mystery priest, and Dionysus continues responding in riddles, which infuriates the young king, who wants to know about these rituals that take place at night. Anyway, convinced that the Bacchus rites are corrupting the people, he orders the soldier to cut off Dionysus' long curly hair, takes his thyrsus, and throws him in prison, and enslaves his army of women. We hear more of the rites as the maidens are introduced again, seeming to chant an incantation. They call it the motherless mystery. So here... Euripides is carefully making reference to the oldest mystery known, the Eleusian mystery. So now we know about the Sibeli mysteries, the Bacchus mysteries, and the Eleusian mysteries. And that's another conversation. The Eleusian mystery was most revered and secret celebrations where slaves and women could practice, but all initiates swore a vow of secrecy. So it brought people together. It didn't matter whether you were of status or if you were not. It involved reenacting the capture and rape of Persephone by Hades and Demeter, who is the goddess of the harvest, fertility, and the earth. 
She never married, but had two children by her brother Zeus, and the children were Persephone and a son Aeacus. Demeter, anguished over the disappearance of her daughter, eventually um, she was reunited, but during her daughter's disappearance, Demeter neglected the earth, and there was no harvest in the land. Another fascinating story for some other time or for you to look up. Well, it is in the Homeric hymn that we are offered information about these mystery rites, which were proffered by Demeter herself to the people of Eleusius, who were forbidden by Athenian law to disclose the secrets of the mysteries, and those who disobeyed were punished with death penalty. So, as we return to the site of the Bacchus rites, because that's where we're at, the maidens are making supplication for the return of Dionysus. They know his situation. They're praying to the gods, and they begin summoning the gods Axios and Io. Euripides, in this chant, gives us a slight introduction to the tale of King Cadmus and the dragon. Another story again. Um, in the middle of their rites, the maidens are amazed that Dionysus was able to escape as he appears before them, and now, from his followers, he's recognized also as a priest. And they begin drilling him. They want to know how he was able to escape the shackles. But Dionysus says that it was all an illusion. He said he gave his captured dreams for food, as he put it, and Pentheus began having visions and started seeing things that were not there. So what do you think that means? Did Dionysus have the ability to mesmerize and hypnotize? We were told that he had traveled to the region of India, and they are people known to have the ability to charm with words and music. The snake charmers, right? Well, apparently the palace caught fire, and in that rouse Dionysus escaped clearly understanding that the young king will be coming for him and he shares a beautiful message and he says I will endure for still are the ways of wisdom and her temper trembleth not you see how these things have personification the wisdom is like given all this personality she does not tremble so funny thing then Dionysus is back at the palace and Pentheus, full of fury. He wants to know how Dionysus was able to escape him. Dionysus attributes it to his father, God Zeus. And then, while they're having this little conversation, a messenger comes in to tell that women were going up to the forest mountain and that among them, he saw his aunt and his mother. He said that they appeared to be sleeping and that they were like in a bed of leaves, and that there was no dancing, there was no drums like they're told. But out of nowhere, Agave, Pentheus' mom, started shouting, saying she was hearing things, and started chanting. And at that time, women just started popping out of like all around the area there, and they were wearing their bacal attire and carrying snakes. And I've said this in one of the other mythology videos that I have here on the channel. It seems that these snakes, they have something going on with women. They've been around since the Garden of Eden. And if you do any research on ancient polypharmacy, you will discover that snake venom had many uses and the priestesses were learned in creating poisons from the snake venom to be used for poisoning arrow tips used in hunting and battle. So you could see why government officials of the time wanted these um, priestesses. They, they were sought after. And maybe that's what this whole thing with the Argonauts had to do, had to do with this knowledge and the Medea thing, you know? Anyway, they also knew the counter-agents to heal someone that may have been um, poisoned. Seriously, the level of detail that Euripides offers in this tragic play about Dionysus' rites is creepy. 
So the messenger goes on to recount that some women also were carrying animals, fawns and cubs, and they were feeding the animals with milk. Or was it really milk? He then said that they were wielding their theris and water would come from the rocks and, and wine from the earth, as well as milk. He saw honey dripping from the wands. I wonder how close that messenger had to get to see honey dripping from the wands. How would he know? Anyways, he and his other messengers were hidden and they wanted to drag the queen out of that situation. Um, but she spied them first and ordered the bacchanals to hunt them down. They were able to escape, but before they did, these guys were able to watch how the woman took a cow and tore it apart as well as a steer, and they watched body parts flying through the air. A carnage party, so it seems. After that, the bacchanals ran into town, grabbing little children and running off with them. An army of town folk went after them, but these women were maniacs. Nothing could hurt them. Yet, they were adept with their wands, which were really spears in disguise. So you see, when we're told earlier that these are master spear fighters, they were not missing their mark. They were able to thwart off their opposition. The messenger then said that he referred to them as holy women. So there again, there's a reference that not only are these adept spear fighters, but they are priestesses. They're holy women. It seemed that this whole rite goes on through the wee early morning hours, like till sunrise, because he said that at dawn, then they went back to the mountains where they washed and he saw the snakes licking the water drops from the women's faces, from their hair and their breast. Now, I can only ask, what was the end game for that? What, is there some part of the, the, the need for women's sweat or whatever from, you know, for, for the diet for the snakes? Hmm. Uh, even the messenger warns Pantheus, and suggests that he honor this new god of the vine. What I don't understand is, what was meant when the messenger said, quote, Let him live, for if he die, then love herself is slain, and nothing joyous in the world again. End quote. I don't know what to say if I saw that savagery. <laughs> I really don't. So, it is in the next few scenes that Dionysus cunningly begins manipulating the conversation and is able to get Pentheus to go from a full-on attack on the band of women to instead, well, have a change of heart and go spy on them dressed up as a woman. Dionysus himself said that no man may see their mysteries. Not that men were not partaking in the Bacchus rites, but they had to dress up as a woman and they were then part of the rites. So men and women were in the rites, but the men had to dress up as women. That's how I understand it. So if you know different, please do give me uh, some, some of your insights. It just seemed that the deepest of the mysteries were not revealed to initiates, that there were different levels of access to what would happen, you know, what part that people could take part of. Anyways, the story goes on, and as I see it, it seems that Pentheus becomes the sacrifice, and um, Dionysus gains his vindication. And it is in this verse that I, I take that from. Quote, Dreams of the proud man, making great and greater ever things which are not of God. For strangely graven is the orb of life that one and another in golden power may outpass his brother. And they win their will, or they miss their will, and the hopes are dead or pined for still. But whoever can know, as the long days go, that to live is happy hath found his heaven. End quote. 
Pentheus decides that going in disguise as a woman would be the best option, and as he's getting ready to head out, something happened. He is having visions, seeing things. He says the sun shines twofold in the sky, and he sees Dionysus now in the form of a bull with horns. And it also seems that he's possessed with some extra powers. As Pentheus, he's amazed at the strength he feels. So then Dionysus takes advantage and probes him to see if Pentheus has had a change of heart. But Pentheus admits he is going in disguise to set a trap and capture the women. Now, what happens next is mania. Pentheus seems to be possessed himself. We are told that Pentheus will be unrecognizable even to his mother. She too is beginning to see visions and will see nothing. She will not see Pentheus, but see him as a lion. And in that stupor state was how Pentheus arrives to spy on the maidens doing their rites. But as it turned out, Dionysus revealed the hiding spot. And as the mob of women, manic women, closed in on him, Pentheus' stupor or drug began to wear off and slowly begins coming out of whatever trance he was in. And it was his mother who was foaming at the mouth. She began tearing him from limb to limb while the other sisters joined in. She returns to the palace with her son's head on a pike and ready to show it off to her father, the old King Cadmus, and to the, to the village, to the town folk. But King Cadmus already heard the news before she arrived and had gone out to get the remains of his grandson. When he returns, his daughter is still under this influence. She's drenched in blood and she's still in this Bacchus thing and begins to talk to her. And slowly, she begins to regain her senses and becomes aware of the tragedy that was rendered from her bare hands as she sees the very head of her son in her hands. Dionysus appears in the cloud, Agave asking for mercy, but Dionysus simply says, too late, and he renders punishment and vanishes in the clouds, as he said he would. So now Agave has been punished for spreading rumors about Semele, as well as her own pride. She was the one who killed her own son, Pentheus, and Dionysus causes her to parade around all of Thebes carrying the severed head of her son. And that is how the Bacchae of Euripides is concluded with vindication by one, punishment for the other. I hope that you have enjoyed it. Truly, it is a tragic play. If you are interested in listening to the play itself, um, I do have it on the channel. Click on the link in the description. And uh, it is translated by Gilbert Murray. I do offer his notes, so that's why it's a very long uh, play. Uh, but I do hope you enjoy it. Leave me your feedback. And hey... I'll see you at the next video here on my channel, wherever that may be. Be blessed.